So, today we're talking about living in the unanswered question. And this is a, an idea that I'm really, really intrigued with, and I feel it's really current because I feel we're exploring different ways of looking at the world. You know, it's that shift from living in a limited mindset to an infinite mindset. How do you live in a world that's infinite, that has infinite possibilities? Sorry, my nose is itchy. When, uh, when we've been trained in a system of limitation, right? It's so easy to say, ah, yes, we all live in an infinite universe. We are all one. I am a co-creator with God. Like we can say these things, but our training is all in a limited world where that's not possible at all. Like, it, it, So how do we bring this theory, this idea into our actual life? How do we actually live an infinite existence here in a world that's trained us to live in the finite, to live in the blocks, right? So one of my favorite quotes that I think put this idea in my mind years ago that's been rolling around, talk about living in the unanswered question, this quote that just played in my consciousness, and it's by Rainer uh, Rilke, and this is, this is a, a part of what he said. He said, be patient towards all that is unresolved in your heart and try to love the questions instead. And this is part of uh, his writings to a young poet, it's called. And he's trying to explain to this person, you know, life isn't what you think it is. You know, because we get very frustrated. We have so many things we want answers for. And then we get so upset, right? And so instead, he says, be patient towards all that is unresolved in your heart and instead love the questions. That is so different to love the questions instead. Then he goes on to say, do not now strive to uncover answers. I wrote it out. They cannot be given to you because you have not been able to live them. And then there's another quote in there, and he says that the point of life is to live them. And so often, I think we have a question and we want an answer, but we don't understand that the answer comes through living. You know, it's almost like we want to sit in our armchair, ask the question, get the answer and remain sitting in our armchair and never live. But that's not the real answers, right? That's not actually, um, that's not life. That's just Googling something. That's not interesting. We didn't grow as a soul. We didn't have a new experience. We didn't expand. We didn't do anything. We just found a pat answer for something. So I'm just going to read that one more time. Be patient towards all that is unresolved in your heart and try to love the questions instead. Do not now strive to uncover answers. They cannot be given to you because you have not been able to live them. So one of the big reasons that I want to talk about this today is not only how to navigate infinity, how to live in this world as it truly is, as opposed to this strange, limited box that we believe we live in, but it's also to understand how we have choice. Like we talk about that a lot, but we all have choice. We have choice in every situation, but what does that mean? What does it mean to have choice? How, how does that work? Like it's easy to say the words, but how does it work in a practical way? And the other reason I want to talk about this is that when we live in the question, we bring back wonder. We bring back expansiveness. We bring back that childlike wonder that, you know, whoa, I just landed on this planet. Oh my, a bug. 
Look at the bug. That's so cool. Wow, I've never done skipping rope before. I've never climbed a mountain. I've never swum in the lake before. Isn't this an amazing new experience? Somewhere along the line, as we become adults, we start to think that we have all the answers. Or if we don't have all the answers, we just take whatever answer we can, even if it's not true, even if it's incomplete, because we are trained to accept answers, to feel safe, even when they're not real. So our talk's gonna have two parts. The first part is I'm gonna talk about the reasons it's so hard to live this way and what limits us. And the second part is what it's like to truly live in that unanswered question. And so one of the weird thing about questions and answers is we are addicted to answers. We believe that the point of life is to find answers. So imagine even our first education, <clears throat> forgetting about home, being at home, but it, when we go to school, what's the point of school? Is to learn the answers and then regurgitate them back. And if we can repeat the answers we've been given, we get an A. Having an answer means you're smart, right? Having all those answers, that's, that's really important. To say I don't know is a sign of ignorance. This, I don't believe this obviously, but this is what we're told. This is ignorant. What's wrong with you? How come you haven't found this? You know, the answers are all out there. You just have to look for them. And we, this is deeply ingrained in us that we must have answers and we must navigate from those answers. That's responsible. Imagine how different it would be if you had a test in school and they said, whatever you do, only answer the questions that you know the answers for. But what are we told instead? We're, set, we're told, now, put an answer down whether you know it or not. Because the answer is all that matters. Because you might happen to be right and you might happen to get a, a point. But what if instead tests were used differently? And the teachers look at the tests and went, wow, isn't that interesting? Nobody got number five. Okay, here's an opportunity to expand and teach and go into that. But instead, everything is about the answers. Even when we're learning something, what's the number one question in your head? Is this going to be on the test? Is this going to be on the test? Do I have to know these answers for the test? So learning, the very process of learning is this seeking of answers. And then once I have the answers, I am learned. <laughs> it is, it is like, this is endemic. It's a, it's a, it's part of our training that having the answers is the point of life. And of course, now I have the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in my head where they, they fly through the whole universe seeking the answer. And of course the answer is 42. And then they realize that they don't know what the question is. And then they have to go off into the world and look for the question. The, what was the question? The question to uh, everything in the universe or something like that. But the truth is, our biggest challenge isn't that we don't have answers. It's that we don't know what a question is. My daughter, Taylor, she is amazing. I love hanging out with her with other people. Because all she ever does is ask them questions. You know, we would, I remember um, a couple times ago, we went to my dad's place and we're sitting there and I went off, I think I was actually teaching or something in my room and she was off in the, in the kitchen with my dad and my dad's like 87, lived an interesting life, like cool guy. And I go out and there they are talking about things I have never heard my dad talk about. He's telling stories that I've never heard, which is amazing because I get my storytelling from my family. I come from a long line of preachers and teachers. <laughs> we like to tell stories. And I had never heard anything that they were talking about. But Taylor is so brilliant at asking people questions. And she'll just sit there and she'll just, oh, 
well, what about that? And she will just come up with this question. And I'm more amazed by her question than even what the conversation is. And I think, wow, what a great question. Or we'll go driving down the road and she'll look out at something. She'll go, isn't that interesting? I wonder if this and this and this, huh? And everything is a question. No matter where we're going, she's always asking questions. And it's been really cool because we've been apart for a long time. Not a long time, but she was over in Europe and I was traveling around the world. And so it's really neat to hang out again because she just never stops asking questions. And it's fascinating. It is just like this entirely different reality hanging out with her. <clears throat> this idea of the answer is so integral to our training. I remember when, um, um, so originally I went to school for mathematics. And then 10 years later, I had gone through the healing process with the breast lumps. If anybody's new, um, my book, What If You Could Skip the Cancer, and all these things, it was a huge journey of <laughs> massive dark nights of the soul and a, uh, my soul taking a right turn <laughs> <clears throat> in life. And then after that, I started doing healing work with people. And, you know, you know, life is wild. And I realized that what people really wanted to do was talk. And so I ended up doing a lot of counseling with people, especially after What If You Could Skip the Cancer came out. And I realized, you know, this was dumb. I really should go and actually maybe study psychology. So I went back to university to study psychology. And the first couple of years were great, you know, because I could study Jung and Frankel and all these amazing people who blended spirituality, consciousness and everything into our psychology, the, the science that we'd understood about the brain and everything. And I loved it. I was just so, so inspired all the time. Then by year three, they had changed the curriculum, or they hadn't changed the curriculum. They had started to remove all of these teachers that I thought were so inspiring. Because at that time, I have no idea what it's like now, but at that time, psychology wanted to be considered a real science. They didn't want it to be considered kind of a woo-woo, soft science. So they had changed the intention that every, everything they wanted to prove had to be able to be tested on a rat or a monkey. So it all came down to behavioral condition, conditioning, operant conditioning, all these kind of things. If you could make a monkey do it, it obviously was representative of humans. So they had taken away the infinite. They had taken away the expansive humanity that we really are. They had taken away any chance of divinity or, you know, quantum potential because we have to be able to be able to put humans in a box and then we can be considered a, a real science. Well, this is where I started arguing with professors, right? <laughs> because the, the viewpoint, because I hadn't figured this out, I figured it out in hindsight. But at the time, I couldn't understand what had just happened to this amazing study I was a part of. And then I realized that, wow, they've actually taken away all the questions. They've taken away all the unknown to the point that what they're actually now teaching isn't real. It's not even applicable. It might be applicable to rats and monkeys, but it's no longer applicable to humans. And if it is applicable to humans, it's such a tiny aspect of the human experience. It doesn't have any long-term benefit. And so I ended up leaving the university at that point and realizing I could get a better education just independently <laughs> and reading about it. But this has happened in so many aspects of science where, you know, the difference between classical physics and quantum physics, again, classical physics says, no, 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 we're only going to look at the limited world. We're only going to look at that which we can see, measurements that we can take, experiments we can repeat. And if that isn't it, then we're not doing it. And everything else, we're just like, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Like, that's not, it's not real. So we take away all the infinity. We take away everything, which is why quantum physics was such a blow 
to the physics world, which is why it still isn't accepted by many aspects of the scientific world, because it's like, no, the point is answers. We cannot be flying around in all this unknown, even though they have actually deleted the unknown to feel safe that their theories are solid, even though they don't actually apply to the world around them. But we have this thing. And this belief has been ingrained into us that it's unsafe to live in the unknown. It's unsafe to live in the questions that I need to know, I need to know something. So for example, think about relationships. When relationships go wrong, what do we say? One, we say, why? And this is not a question. We have to be very careful. When I say to live in the unanswered question, we have to be very, very careful of the word why because it can end up this unending torture, right? Like Viktor Frankl, who was an Austrian Jewish psychologist, he lived in the, in the Auschwitz and um, the death camps and things. And this was the one teaching of his, was whatever you do, don't get stuck in the question why, because it's a never ending answer and it's not the good kind that we're talking about today. He said people who, you know, lost everything in the, in the concentration camps, for them to spend the rest of their life asking why, that's not, an an, it's not, it's not anything that's ever going to get answered. There's no growth in finding the answer. There's no journey in it. There's nothing. So we have to be very careful of the question why. On occasion, why can be interesting. So for example, you know, um, when the world kind of went through its experience two years ago. I was in the States and I had to return to Canada. And I might ask myself, I wonder why that happened. That's weird, right? That's a different why. That's a huh. And then I get to unfold what happens next. And thank goodness, like here I am, happy as anything, thinking, yeah, this was nice. And this was a funny, funny answer to unfold, you know, as to what the why was. So we just, when I, when we talk about unanswered questions, be careful about why it's a, it's a funny one, but in relationships, let's say something goes wrong. Maybe somebody has an affair. Maybe somebody dies. Maybe somebody just falls out of love and we say, why? See, it's always that why, right? I just want to know, just give me an answer. Just tell me something. I need something to hold on to. Well, the answer we get will never be true. It might be a fraction of, of a shadow of truth, but it's nowhere close to the truth. When things happen in relationships, they are very multidimensional. They are very complex. They're very complex personally in terms of our own patterns, karma, perspectives on the world and love. And they're very complex in the person we're with. It's not simple, but if we push to get an answer either within ourselves or from the other person, we're going to get this short, flippant, maybe cruel answer. And if we internalize that, we are not internalizing truth. And it's very dangerous to think there's an answer. It's so much better to simply allow the unanswered question and say, huh, and I'm going to say, I wonder why that happened. But not with a, I must know or else I can't live. Just a, I suppose one day I'll know. It's like one of my favorite Steve Jobs quotes. Is he, uh, he did a, um, an address at a university in the States once. And he said, as we walk through life, we never know. We can't connect the dots as we're walking. We can only connect the dots in hindsight. In the moment, all we can do is have faith in our choice to make this step and then have faith in our choice to make that step and have faith in our choice to make the next. And it's not until much later that we connect the dots and can see why those things had to happen. And this is a huge deal. It reminds me of... Uh, you know the movie 28 Days with Sandra Bullock and uh, Viggo Morgensen? 
there's this great, so she's a, a recovering alcoholic. He's a recovering sex addict <laughs> and drugs, everything. And, and she's, and they're struggling because one of the struggles we have as humans is I just want to know that if I do this, then this will happen and this will happen and this will happen and I'll have made the right choice. I want to feel safe that I'm making the right choice and I'm not just going to screw up again. And what if I screw up and oh, what if I end up, you know, this is what we do to ourselves. Like we're so attached to the outcome. We drive ourselves crazy. And then we don't do anything. We just choose to not do anything. We just, you know, we end up in analysis paralysis or total fear and we just choose to do nothing. So there's this great scene in the movie where he's out and he's, I think he's also a professional baseball player, a professional pitcher or something. So he's standing there and he's pitching balls against the tree or something. And, uh, and she's watching him and he says, come here, let me, let me teach you something. And uh, the unwilling student Sandra Bullock plays, <laughs> he goes up and she's holding the ball and he says, and I'm going to totally uh, ruin this because it's been a long time since I watched the movie, but he basically is saying, the only control you have is the moment between now and the moment you release the ball. You don't even have control as to what happens to the ball once it leaves your hand. The only control you have is right now to have the proper stance, to keep your eyes focused on the target, to do everything you possibly can to throw it in the direction you want, and then you have to just let it go. This is living in the unanswered question. This is totally believing that, you know what? This is me right now. I have a question for the future. I have a question for my personal expansion. I have a question in this relationship. I have a question as to my mission. And all I can do is take a step and take a step and take a step. This is how we live in infinity. Like imagine the difference in your inner experience here. You throw the ball, but you're not attached to the outcome. As soon as we aren't attached to the outcome, anything can happen. And that can feel really scary, right? That's why we want to be attached to the outcome, because we want to make sure the bad things don't happen or what we perceive as bad doesn't happen, right? But what if we don't, we're not in fear? What if we have faith in ourselves? What if we connect with our truth. We connect with satya. Satya isn't just truth. It's our divine self here incarnate on the earth. This is my connection to my path, my journey. And when I practice listening to that, which is on its own quite a journey, but when I practice that, all I know is I want to turn right now. I want to take a step here now. And what happens from there? There are infinite possible outcomes. This is where we allow infinity into our lives. Because we aren't limiting our own sight. Right? We create our reality. If I say, if I do this thing, here are the only three possible outcomes that I will accept. Well, then you know what our world looks like? these three possible outcomes. Everything else, doesn't. we can't even see it because it's outside of our line of possibilities. So our life becomes limited. And then we make another choice. And these are the only outcomes possible. And these are the only outcomes possible, right? So what if those aren't the only three? What if I have no idea what the outcome might be? And I just accept that. And I enjoy it. Well, here's the crazy thing. This is where life is actually fun and interesting and exciting. There's a reason that people do extreme sports. There's a reason people are, are, are called adrele, ad, ad, adrenaline junkies. Because there is something about feeling alive. There is something about living on that edge of who we are of actually in constant growth, in constant expansion. 
This is where we're actually alive. When we limit the possibilities to only this, and oftentimes it's only this or this, it's only binary, right? That's our entire existence and it's boring. As much as we've been trained that there is great comfort and security in pretending we know the answers, it's so boring and we don't feel alive. And we feel that life is just like, why bother getting up in the morning? And yet the only reason we're bored is because we're so stuck in the old answers we've accepted as reality. So instead, imagine we live on the edge of our own truth and we perpetually step forward having no idea what could happen. Then we take another step having no idea. Every day, we would wake up going, having no idea what today held. All we knew is that we do have faith in every step, whatever those steps are. But every day becomes an adventure. And I know that sounds corny, but it really does. You literally wake up and you're like, what's today about? I have no idea, but I'm intrigued. <laughs> Who knows? And I really mean this. I even mean this in relationships. I mean in difficulty. I mean in health. I mean in all the big stuff, the really difficult things. What if we truly just lived on the edge? You know, when I was, when I was sick back in 1999, when I had the breast lumps, so of course my mom had just died of breast cancer. I had two, my kids were really little, which is hard to fathom if you've seen them now, <laughs> but they were just these little two and four year olds. And my family was so frightened of cancer, obviously, because everyone had died of cancer. So it was a really big deal for me to get sick. But what I ended up having to do, and I didn't do this intentionally. Well, I did it intentionally, but again, I couldn't connect the dots until later. I actually didn't talk to most people about my journey, including my family, including my sisters, who I was really close with, my dad, who I was really close with. I didn't share my journey with them because I needed the freedom to live on this edge of truth. I needed to be able to sit in quiet and listen and figure out how do I even hear this truth? How do I connect with the God within the divine? How do I do this? And if I was around people who wanted answers all the time, why are you doing this? How come you're not going to the doctor? What are you thinking? Don't you realize that mom just died? Like, if I had people around me doing that, I would lose faith in living at that edge. It would wear me down. I was tired. I wasn't this, you know, strong, robust, stable person. I was crashing and burning. I was in a crisis in body, mind, and spirit. I didn't have the strength to argue with them. So I just cut them out of my life for a time. If they called, I just sort of gave them vague answers, right? Because I knew, and I didn't know at the time, but I knew that there was a power in living at this edge of having faith and just taking one step every day and then wondering what's going to happen next. I had lived my whole life so methodically up until that point. You know, I mean, I have a degree in mathematics, but that's not the point. The point is my brain likes to work like that. It likes a system. It likes to know that it can find the answers. Not only can I find the answer, I can find the optimum path. And then I am so successful. I have done it. I have reached my mission. I have done what I need to do. So I had done this my whole life, really calculated every choice I made. So the idea of me dropping all of that systematic thinking, all of that blind faith in these answers that had brought me to a dead end in my life, it was a huge deal. It's a huge leap of faith to say, I am going to live without answers. I am going to live in the question. I am just going to step forward in faith and allow 
infinity to be my playground. That is so radical in our world today. And you really need to have people around you who can understand, who aren't asking you weird questions to justify and explain yourself. <clears throat> so on a really practical level, what does this look like to live in this question, to live on the edge, to allow infinite possibilities, infinite outcomes? So imagine it in a conversation. How often in conversations do we actually have the same conversations over and over and over again? And it isn't just the person we're talking to. It's us. We repeat stories. We repeat stories. It's almost like if something interesting happened, the next five people we meet, we're going to tell them those same stories. And then if we know this person, we probably have an idea what they're going to say. Like we've kind of premeditated the whole conversation and nothing new comes out of it. And then we say, I don't even like talking to that person. It's so boring. But we're playing a role in that. We are also repeating ourselves. And we aren't imagining that this is an infinite person sitting in front of us. What if every time we had a conversation, whether it's with a friend, a colleague, a boss, a partner, a child, a parent, that we didn't repeat the past. We didn't tell the story we've already told 10 other people. What if we just lived in that moment and asked this person a question? What if we discover something about their perspective on the universe? And I mean an eight-year-old child, anybody. <clears throat> Imagine how different it is. And this is where there's a skill in this. There's a, a skill to be learned about how to even ask questions because we've only been taught to find answers. Right? So this is actually, I, I personally am not really good at this. This is why I'm doing this talk. <laughs> because I am not good at asking people questions. Because every time I sit with someone, I think to myself, all right, what would Taylor do? She would ask them a question. And nothing comes to me. So this annoys me a lot. <laughs> so this is, this is part of my, uh, my own growth edge is... Look at this person. Feel them. Why? What do you want to know? What, what, do you, what would you like to figure out? Or what would you like to discuss with this person? You know, do maybe I don't even know enough about them to even ask them questions. Maybe I need to ask questions about what they love to do and then ask more questions about that. It's fascinating, but it's almost like we're not accustomed to having open-ended conversations where we don't know where it's going to go. It's really interesting. Yeah. And then, so we will talk about soup for a minute. <laughs> for anyone who's new, soup is also sex. And even in intimacy, one of the biggest things I teach in tantric intimacy is to let go of the outcomes. Like we'll say that, we'll say, we'll let go of the goal of orgasm, let go of the goal of, of ejaculation. And people say, oh, so we're, we're not supposed to orgasm. And it's like, no, but the goal is limiting your field. Then there's infinite possibilities here. And there's so many more reasons to make love than to simply get off. The in, infinite ways of connecting with another soul are so worth playing with. Like the subtle connections, these interesting things that warm your heart and make you feel human and make you feel a little bit more connected to them for some reason. These are the reasons to make love. Orgasms and all that, they'll happen. That's so easy. Dogs have orgasms. That's easy. That's no big deal. But there's so much more possible, which like, it's like it spreads the joy out into a million ways. But again, it's living in the unanswered question. You imagine making love like you have no idea what you're doing. All you know is there's this human in front of you. 
and infinite possibilities, infinite possible ways you could go next. You know, it's so easy in intimacy to get stuck in a pattern that, well, I do this, and then they do this, and then I do this, and they do this, and I do this, and they do this, and we all get off and we pass out, right? That can be fun, but we also could always stay centered and go, what do I feel like doing right now? Whoa, that's weird. <laughs> like, I think I've told some of you guys this story. One time, back in the train station, I was teaching a course in Tantra. And, and it was really interesting because a lot of the people that were there were students of mine, like from yoga or meditation or things like that. And they had dragged their partners. Some came as individuals, some came with their partners. But the partners that were there had been dragged by their, their, their partner, who was one of my students, who didn't know anything about Tantra. It was in a very small town, so this was very edgy. And so they were a little worried about being there because this was weird. But they trust their partner, and their partner trusted me, so it must be okay. And there was this one couple, and they were an older retired couple, you know, with eight grandkids and they're on the farm and, you know, that kind of thing. Really sweet. And the guy, he just really loved his wife, right? He, but he, this idea of being in a train station, talking, um, for anyone who didn't know, I had a train station that I had renovated into a wellness center. It wasn't really a train station. I figured that might make this really sound like a weird story. Um, but he's sitting in this station with this, all these strangers talking about sex and intimacy like in the land of places he'd rather not be, this was like right up there. So every week he would just kind of put up with it and, you know, the, you know we'd do check-in and he'd be like, I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> he was just like, no problem, right? And then one week I told, we were talking about this, we were talking about this infinite possibilities. And <laughs> I said, okay, you guys have to go home and you can touch each other but whatever you do you're not allowed to have sex and you get to touch each other in ways that you've never touched each other before and not like in I don't mean like this new technique that you know not that I mean just be intimate with each other right anyway so the next week they come in well this guy is marching in like he owns the place right and he walks in grabs the chair, puts it between his legs, sits down, and he says, come on, Katrina, are we going to get this show on the road or what? When are we checking in? <laughs> and I'm like, really? <laughs> so he sits down and he goes, well, I'll tell you what happened. He says, I'll tell you. He says, you told us not to have sex and you told us to touch us, each other in weird ways. <laughs> well, these guys have been married for like, you know, 45 years. And they're lying in bed and he's got, you know, his big back, right? And he's lying on his side like this. And his wife, and they would have been in their, I don't know, their late 60s or something. She had this little tickle inside of her brain that said, rub your nose along his back. <laughs> so she went up and she just rubbed her nose across his back. Well, it just created, and, he, and, and then he just looks at me and goes, let's just say, we went against the rules because there was no way we weren't having sex after that. <laughs> but it was just this tiny little thing. And it just exploded in this passionate lovemaking that he was just like, I've never done anything like that in my life. It was so epic. Like he just couldn't talk about it enough. Like it was literally like we couldn't get on to the next check-in. <laughs> From this one little thing that they'd never done before. <laughs> Like, like, imagine living like that. Imagine just listening within and doing this one little thing that doesn't make any sense, but it feels right. Well, then I'm just going to do it. And I have no idea how this is going to turn out. Right? Imagine. <laughs> And it can be anything, like even in our own lives. Because a lot of times we talk about, you know, what do we really love to do? What's our mission in the world? What are we supposed to be doing here? And I remember when I was sick, um, I would read a lot of Bernie Siegel and Carl Simonton and Deepak Chopra and 
Wayne Dyer. They were the big guys. Um, actually, no, sorry. They were the big guys when my mom was sick. By the time I was sick, there were more self-help guys out there. But my mom was sick in uh, hmm, 35 years ago, 40 years ago. <laughs> wow. And, uh, and these were the only guys out there. And one of the things they were discovering with people who had were getting cancer, especially women who got breast cancer, was that they never did anything that they loved. They knew what their husband wanted. They knew what their children liked to do. But they had no idea um, what they loved to do. They didn't know what fired them up. And I feel like this is really common in our world. We're, we've... We've sort of been trained to be spectators in life. We've been trained in school that you watch the athletes play games. We listen to the musicians play music. We look at the art that artists do. But we are just spectators. And we become kind of spectators in life. So it's really quite a leap. It's really quite a journey to figure out, but what do I love to do? What if I love playing the guitar? whether I'm ever a professional or I make money at it or whether I would be considered, you know, good or not. What if I just love playing the guitar? So it's an interesting thing to use this unanswered question in our own kind of journey to happiness. You know, like, what do I love to do? And then live in that question. What do I love to do? And then, um, I don't know, see what comes. Maybe suddenly you hear a song or you watch some show or someone randomly comes up to you and says, you know what I just picked up doing? And you go, wow, that sounds really fun. And then you jump into it. Because again, one of the reasons we don't try new things is because we don't know what the outcome will be. And because we're so attached to that outcome, that answer, that fixed thing, we don't just jump in and try stuff. You know, I remember when I used to teach, I used to teach dance, like ballroom dance and Latin dance. And uh, teaching adults dance is hilarious. If you teach five-year-olds how to dance, they will dance with you for five years and never really get anything right and be blissfully happy. An adult comes to a dance class and if they don't get it right on the first day in the first 20 minutes, yeah, well, they can't dance. I can't do it. <laughs> We are so afraid of learning and expanding. It's so uncommon in our world, right? <laughs> and sometimes it's as easy as just look at waking up in the morning and actually asking ourselves, I wonder what today's all about. Like even if you have, even if you have the day planned, maybe you live in a very busy time in your life. You know, that your day isn't really yours. Lots of, lots of us live like that, right? But within that structure, within that time schedule, anything can happen. Aha moments, new people, all kinds of great things can happen. But it's almost like as long as we expand the filter that I wonder what today brings. I wonder what I'll learn today. I wonder what I'll discover today. I wonder what I'll experience today. It's like when we open up to the possibilities, they magically appear. Like it's a thing. <laughs> like that whole nature abhors a vacuum. You start asking questions, answers will come. <laughs> like you can't help it. It's like, yeah, you just can't help it. It's like you almost have to be careful what you ask for because look out. Like <laughs> it could even be. Um, uh, what did I just say? Nature abhors a vacuum. <laughs> um, see, this is my problem. I'm being, I'm starting to be able to see, see the chat. It's a problem. <laughs> it's very distracting for me. But, um, yeah, see, that's what I, I, I can't look at the chat. <laughs> Oh yeah. So sometimes we feel like we feel very alone in life. 
Like we feel that we don't have friends, or we don't have people that we can be confidants with, or we just feel that maybe, the, the, you know, it's just not for me or something. And even in meeting people, it is so interesting to just simply say, I would love to meet new people. I would love to meet great confidants. I would love to find some people to have fun with. How could I do that? And then just leave it. Like, don't try to answer it. Just leave it. You've spoken. The, the universe will respond. And then you'll be sitting there and all this, this happens to me all the time. <laughs> this is my life. Like, I'm telling you. I, uh, and so then what'll hap- what would happen to me is I would ask the question and then I would make a coffee and I would sit down and suddenly I would have this urgent desire to walk uptown. Just got to walk uptown. Why am I walking uptown? I have no idea. Oh, maybe I should go to the drugstore for something. No, nope, you're just walking uptown. And I have no idea why. And I inevitably will meet someone. Or maybe I won't meet someone. But like I would go walking reading, like I like to read, not right now because it's icy out and it's cold, so it's no fun. But I would walk and I would read. And the number of people that would come up to me later and they'd say, I would like, I would be going to a grocery store and I would be chatting about something and the cashier would say, I've seen you walking around reading. <laughs> I'd say, oh yeah, it's so cool. And then they say, don't you fall over? And I'm like, no, it's weird. It's like a meditation. And then you have this connection with your feet. Really? And now I'm having this really interesting conversation with this complete stranger because I just decided to go walking down E Street reading a book one day for absolutely no reason. Like we don't know. I don't even have to be attached that, oh, obviously I'm going to meet someone because that's what I asked for. And then we can't do that. We actually have to just trust and just, you know, move out into the world and just Trust that every single step is somehow going to make sense one day down the road when we look back and we connect all the dots. (laughs) So thank you so much for joining me today and we will see you soon.